Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's All Space Considered. I'm Dr. David Reitzel, and with us tonight on the program are Patrick So, Chris Butler, and also very special guest, and I hope I don't get mispronounce your last name, but Dr. Emily Levesque, I hope is correct. Um, yes. Close enough, at least, that she's from University of Washington, and we can't wait to start our program to talk about her. But first, a few announcements. First of all, um, All Space Considered is brought to you by the City of Los Angeles and the Department of Recreation and Parks, and of course, Griffith Observatory. And we also would like to thank the Griffith Observatory Foundation for all the help and support. Um, they are our nonprofit partner. And we'll uh, actually speak with a foundation employee tonight about uh, something interesting she saw while out looking at the stars. Um, so it's gonna be great. On tonight's program, we have Massive Star Life and the Last Stargazers, like I said, with Professor Emily Levesque from the University of Washington. Um, we'll have our sky report with Patrick out to launch with Chris, pretty pictures and solar system weather with Katie. We're going to talk about Carolyn Shoemaker, a hunter of comets and asteroids. Um, she did pass on, but we're going to celebrate her life a little bit. And then we'll talk about the highlights from the Perseid meteor showers. We'll talk about what meteor showers are and a little bit about some of the ones that are coming up in the future. We'll do our inquiries from the foundation. We have a question from one of our foundation members. And then space crash and asteroid deflection, which as you can see from my picture in the background, <laughs> something like that coming at us, we might want to deflect it. Although I have to say that's a, a really non-physical picture. Uh, things don't burn in space. It wouldn't quite be close enough to be going through the atmosphere <clears throat> to being heated up. So that would be a really weird thing coming at us if there were something like that headed at me. Um, but first of all, tonight, we're going to start with our guest. Often have to be close with our guest, but tonight we're going to get the program off with a, well, the, off with a highlight, let's say, because, you know, usually we end with the highlight, but tonight we're going to begin with it. But we hope you all stay with us for the whole show. Um, and we are going to talk about massive stars and also about a book that our guest has written called The Last Stargazers and even hear a little bit from that that book. So welcome, Emily. And uh, you can call me David, of course, as well. But welcome to our program. Hi, thanks so much for inviting me. A absolutely. Well, you are an expert and you research and study big stars, massive stars. So I wanted to bring this up. It's not the most high res folks, but it works good enough. But I wanted to point out what a massive star is. So first of all, anybody see the sun on here? Anybody see our sun? Well, let me get our laser pointer out. The sun is kind of in the center. It's right below the laser pointer where I have there, that one single pixel there, that little dot. So our sun is not a massive star. So that's not the sort of star you study, I take it. Um, you study stars more like Betelgeuse and, um, you know, Antares and, you know, even some of the blue ones, I suppose, because the blue ones on the main sequence turn into the red ones, as as we might talk about. Um, so this is sort of the different sizes of stars, and our sun is a relatively modestly sized star, and size and mass don't always correlate. So maybe we'll talk about that a little bit tonight, too. They do somewhat, but you can have a low mass star that actually is physically bigger than a star that is of higher mass. So. We might talk about that. Um, here is a diagram that actually kind of shows that relationship. This is our very own um, color magnitude diagram um, in Griffith Observatory. And we recently have refurbished this. The colors are bright and beautiful. And the color corresponds to temperature, but also it does correspond to mass. Massive stars along that main sequence you see there that corresponds to a sequence of mass. The stars in the lower right are low mass and the stars up over here are high mass. Now what's going on up over here and well down here with the white dwarfs that has to do with stellar evolution. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Now let me bring the text version, the textbook version of this one on and you can see it here and you can see on this plot is stellar radius and the sun is located right now above my laser pointer there you can see and it has the size of one conveniently enough our sun has the size of one but baby juice is all the way up here at the top and it's just you know it's like 700 800 times the size of the sun no oh, oh, yeah 10 to the three is a thousand i could still do math one of these days um so baby juice is a huge star and as we all heard 
in the night sky, Betelgeuse is in the sort of shoulder of Orion. Oh, that's a low res picture that I picked for you all. Um, but Orion is gonna start to be visible early, early in the morning. And you wanna get up extra early and see it or whether you wanna stay up late like I would normally be this time of year. Most of you know, I normally go out to the Burning Man Festival. This year it's not happening officially, although there are some crazy people out there on their own, even some people I know. But we'd always know it was getting late in the night while we're out riding bikes, looking at art and whatnot when we'd see Betelgeuse rise. And I'd look up at, I'd look up at the star, you'd see Orion, and I'd look at Betelgeuse and I'd think, when are you gonna blow up? Well, in the news recently, well, recently, this is now a couple of years ago, um, the pandemic, everything feels recently, but there were things talking about the fainting of Betelgeuse. So we decided, oh my goodness, I'm fainting. So we thought Betelgeuse had a little problem and fainted. But really what was going on, of course, is Betelgeuse was dimming. And in January, 2020, it was really dim. It, it, it was quite a bit fainter and the V magnitude is sort of a green color, um, sort of a peak of the visual. It's getting fainter. You saw diagrams like this where um, you see uh, the obser observed points getting fainter and fainter and fainter and some folks were predicting maybe it would bottom out and start to come back up and indeed it did bottom out and return to brightness but it was a star of a lot of interest to folks and here's the picture this is an actual image um, using the vlt in january 2019 before the dimming took place and here's a picture after the dimming took place so i'll, I'll back it up again and go forward. So something was going on. It looked like the Southern hemisphere, if we think North is up, I don't know if it actually is at North is up on this picture, but the lower hemisphere of this star image we're seeing is dimmer. Something was going on there. And folks were thinking, well, could this be giant star spots on it? I reported on it at the time they thought it was that. And, um, but people really weren't sure. A lot of craziness was going on. I love this account on Twitter that was created. Is Betelgeuse okay? And um, it gets a little spicy at times, a little, a little salty, but um, I install one dimmer switch in my dining room, the entire galaxy loses its, okay, we can't say that word on our family program. Um, I did that talk, of course, what's up with Betelgeuse and um, the, the account noticed we were doing it, which I thought was great fun. Uh, I did tweet at the account again. I was hoping they'd notice we're talking again tonight. Um, but anyway, our very own you know, guest tonight works on Betelgeuse and you had a paper come out that you said it was dust. In fact, you were the first group to make that, well, scientific paper to prove it scientifically. People were throwing out all sorts of hypotheses and ideas about what it could be. So how did you come to that conclusion and what observations did you make to, to look at Betelgeuse? Yeah, well, first of all, it's worth mentioning why we're so interested in Betelgeuse in the first place, because Betelgeuse is the exact type of star that I study. It's a red supergiant. Um, we tend to have a soft spot for Betelgeuse as astronomers because it's wonderfully nearby. It's a naked eye star, so we can just look up and keep an eye on it. And it's actually a very kind of garden variety red supergiant. You mentioned how big it is. And if you were to drop Betelgeuse where our sun is, it would swallow up Mars. It would actually make it most of the way to the orbit of Jupiter. And that makes it a medium sized red supergiant. We've actually discovered red supergiants that would eat Jupiter and get close to the orbit of Saturn. So it becomes a really excellent nearby archetype for us to study in detail. And when it started to dim, it caught a lot of people's curiosity because we haven't generally seen other red supergiants do that. And we wanted to understand whether this was something very unusual happening or a fairly normal stage in a red supergiant's life that could give us a few more hints to how these stars work. And we're interested in stars like this because like you said, they are the stars that die as supernovae. So when the dimming happened, all of these headlines came out and um, a lot of science reporters know that Betelgeuse is an aged massive star that's getting ready to end its life. So there were tons of breathless headlines saying, is it gonna blow? Is Betelgeuse about to explode? Dimming, is this the end? And lots of headlines going, astronomers baffled, waiting for it to blow. And a lot of us were being a bit more cautious, but saying, you know, we wanna to get to the bottom of what's going on. And I recognize as the author of the first paper to put this out that dust is about the most disappointing sounding 
explanation possible. You want to hear, you know, wow, something really dramatic is happening to the star. It's about to die. It's, you know, doing something really exciting and it's dusty. Doesn't sound exciting, but it really is. So what we ultimately figured out had happened, and this started with our paper and a bunch of other papers since then have looked into Betelgeuse's behavior more, is about a year, about a year before it started to get really dim, Betelgeuse puffed off some material from its outer layers. So because these stars are so big and cold, their outer layers are really kind of diffuse and not that dense. And from these stars just sort of pulsating and being a little bit unstable, they'll sort of foof off material into their surroundings. That material will then cool off and eventually turn into what we see as dust. And that dust in front of the star will block our view, much like dust on our windows makes our view look dimmer, and will make Betelgeuse appear to dim. So before the dimming happened, that material got puffed off. One of those big star spots that you described wound up rotating right into our line of sight and cooling off the environment right around Betelgeuse, which made that gas then turn into dust. That dust blocked our view and we got that sudden really dramatic dimming that we saw as Betelgeuse starting to disappear. So we took observations of Betelgeuse that let us measure its temperature and we saw okay the temperature really hasn't changed that much. If it had cooled off a lot it might have looked dimmer. Since the temperature hadn't changed we tried to look at how much light we were getting at different colors like how much blue light were we getting from Betelgeuse, how much yellow, how much red and the way that light had changed when Betelgeuse dimmed told us that there was some weird big dust grains blocking our view and then other researchers did amazing observations with huge telescopes with the Hubble Space Telescope with pretty much every instrument we could point at Betelgeuse to figure out this background of that initial burst of mass loss and the cold spot that helped the dust form and we pieced together the story in the end, but it wound up being a kind of normal thing that you would expect a star like Betelgeuse to do. Okay, so you're saying it was not aliens. <laughs> Definitely not aliens. Now, yeah, I, now I, I'm, I'm I, surprised yeah. that someone in the news didn't propose that, though, because it happens I, everywhere. I mean, of course, there was the um, uh, Bajoyan star, Tabby star, I'm trying to remember the last name, but yeah. the one where everyone was like, oh my god, it's a massive superstructure of alien technology dimming this star in the front. Um, they concluded that was also dust dimming it, but it was sort of patchy in some sort of way. Do you know anything? I mean, that's not a massive star, but... Um, no, it was a low mass star, yeah. yeah. I, I Honestly, I don't recall what the ultimate explanation was for that star, which the nickname I love for it is the WTF star, which of course stands for Where's the Flux? Um, yeah, and they saw it get a lot dimmer. It was a great session in the AAS, the, the WTF. I was, I, yeah. well, I saw the session. I forget whether it was remote or in person, but um, it was great. And as I recall, it had, it had something to do with the potential swarm of comets passing by it. But people had a lot of fun imagining an alien megastructure Dyson sphere built around this star. Um, one reason I don't think that ever got pitched for Betelgeuse <laughs> is because, like all massive stars, um, I mean, I didn't see it get pitched very many places. I'm sure it was somewhere. But like all massive stars, Betelgeuse is actually pretty young. Because these stars have so much mass, they fuse elements in their cores through processes that really rip through those elements and those available fuels very quickly. So Betelgeuse, despite being much bigger than our sun, isn't going to live nearly as long as our sun. These stars live 10 million with an M years as opposed to the 10 billion with a B that our sun lives. And we think that you need much longer to make the sort of planets that could make a civilization that could then make space flight, that could then make Dyson spheres. So I think that's what saved us from an alien scenario in Betelgeuse's case. So you're saying they were rational, which I don't believe, but um, in any case, big stars, massive stars, they do live fast, die young. It's that old, you know, they just do. They're, they're, they don't go through the lives very fast. I early on in this show's history made the mistake of saying hot young stars, not making connection of where we were in Hollywood. And our uh, Laura Danley, our Dr. Danley, our old boss, she continually made fun of that for me and I had to say it forever. So I still do, it's good fun. But it's true, the hot young ones stay young even right before they're gonna die. Um, Betelgeuse, when it explodes, it'll create a whole bunch of heavy elements and things like that, generate a shock wave and all the rest. Now. How bright will it get in our sky? I've heard some people say you might be able to read a newspaper by it. Um, Patrick made a wonderful graphic. Check it on one of the old shows. You can go look up. We've shown it a few times that showed it in the sky. But what is your take on it as someone that studies Betelgeuse? 
So I actually had a few colleagues do back of the envelope math when Betelgeuse's dimming was happening because everyone was imagining a Betelgeuse supernova. And if it is up in the nighttime sky when it goes supernova, we might not be able to, you know, easily read a newspaper by its light, but at its peak, it could be as bright as the full moon. If it was up in the daytime sky when it went supernova, that might be visible during the day. It would sort of look like, you know, Venus in the morning. And a lot of this is really speculative because there's a lot we still don't know about supernovae. Um, a thing that we would love to be able to do in astronomy but can't yet is to point at a star like Betelgeuse's day. That star is going to go supernova on this date or in this many years, and it's going to look like this. We have great guesses about sort of what elements will be created in a supernova like that and roughly what it'll look like. But our general rule of thumb is, well, we think Betelgeuse will go supernova soon. And soon is, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, a mere minute in cosmic time, but not really what we hope for if we want to watch it explode tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any in the sky that might go sooner? Do you have any candidates that we should be watching? You know, I'm a big fan of Betelgeuse, and like I said, the the big difficulty when all of these headlines started coming out saying, does dimming mean Betelgeuse is going to explode? A lot of reporters asked me and my colleagues these questions, and our answers were always, no, probably. And a couple people called us out on the probably, but we really did mean it, because we don't know what a star looks like in the days or hours before it explodes. And we don't know what the death throes of a star might look like. There wasn't a lot of evidence that would that it would look like this slow dimming, but there wasn't all evidence that it wouldn't look like that. So Betelgeuse is a good candidate. Antares and a couple of our other neighbor red supergiants are pretty good. Um, and there are a couple other weird massive stars. There's a star named Eta Carina mm -hmm. in the Southern Hemisphere. Somebody knew I was going to say that star. That Absolutely. Is it is in this wonderful class of stars called luminous blue variables, and they're named to be exactly what they look like. They're very bright, they're blue, they're very hot, and they're very variable. These stars can actually do what I think of as faking their own deaths because they will puff off so much mass and do it so violently that it looks like the star has brightened and gone supernova. And we know that this happens near the end of these stars' evolution, so who knows, maybe Eta Carina will be the one that surprises us. There are other stars that used to be red supergiants and have puffed up so much mass that their outer layers have just been peeled off, and they turn into really hot stars before they die. One of those could make a supernova. We have a few of those that we could see. But we haven't had a supernova visible from Earth in the Milky Way since 1604. So it would be really cool to have one happen. I think every supernova astronomer would get wildly excited. Oh, ab absolutely. Um, what's the nearest type two supernova, which by the way, is the type that Betelgeuse is going to be. There's two types. One's a white dwarf that has somehow gets extra mass whether it's colliding white dwarfs or material dumped over. But Betelgeuse being a single star, it'll be at the end of its life. It'll process elements heavier and heavier and heavier, generating the energy it needs to hold itself up against gravity once it makes what well, makes nickel which rapidly decays down to iron so we often we'll hear us say when that core is all iron it has nowhere to get energy out of it and it actually will collapse and then explode there's a, a rebound we believe but what is the nearest supernova like that that we've seen since the modern age of telescopes say that's that's a good question um and this so since the modern age of telescopes we have not seen a galactic supernova. Um, the telescope was invented in about 1608, and the last one we saw was in 1604. The nearest, though, type 2 supernova with a star like Betelgeuse collapsing is actually a supernova a lot of people know because it left behind what we call the Crab Nebula. So the supernova itself was about 6,500 light years away, and it happened in the year 1054. And we actually have records in Chinese and Arabic astronomy of what they call the guest star. It showed up in the night sky for a while and then it left. And there's cave art in New Mexico depicting, we think, this supernova showing up in the daytime sky. And now it's one of the most famous objects in the night sky. Like Hubble takes pictures of the Crab Nebula all the time. We have x-ray images of it. People have it as, you know, desktop backgrounds. So that was probably our near, that I think is our nearest type two supernova that's ever happened. And that was, you know, nearly a thousand years ago. So all the others have been outside our galaxy that we've been studying. You have to get lucky, know someone that has some Gemini time, the telescope that we have up, by the way, that maybe you've seen. And that, that's yes. you down there at Gemini. Now that's Gemini South. That's down in yep. Chile. 
that's the Gemini South Telescope in Chile, and I'm being as good a scale model as I can be at five foot two, but the mirror of that telescope is almost 27 feet from end to end, and it gives you a sense of the scale of the really enormous telescopes that we get to work with professionally for our jobs. Yeah, now that's, that's amazing. Um, being able to create monolithic mirrors like that, eight meters is about what we think is the maximum we're able to do with reasonable technology. So folks have started to combine eight meter mirrors. They've, they've you know, the LBT the, and others. Um, and even now with some of the giant telescopes coming, Keck led the way for smaller segments being used altogether. But a single monolithic mirror like this, it still blows me away. It almost looks like someone's Newtonian, you know, one that's out on the front lawn during one of our star parties. And somehow through the trick of the eye in perspective, you're. It blows my mind that we have telescopes that large that we can use, despite having used them myself. Um, so you know, it's just crazy. What, the laboratory that builds um, that does it builds these sorts of mirrors. Um, the size of that mirror that I'm standing under is pretty much the biggest mirror that they can make because they make it in this huge spinning oven where they basically pour in glass, heat it up until it turns molten, and they spin it so it makes that perfect curved shape that you need for a telescope mirror. And one of the next generation telescopes we're building right now is the giant Magellan telescope, which is also being planned for Chile. And it is seven of those mirrors that I'm standing under right now, mosaic together to make one humongous telescope. Which is just crazy, absolutely crazy. By the way, yeah. one of the comments in our uh, chat, the YouTube chat, somebody said uh, the ty uh, 1987A, the supernova in the LMC was a type two, which I'd forgotten that, but that was the most recent near, quote unquote, meaning in an external dwarf galaxy orbiting our own. And it's, it's so quite far yes. away. That's, that's it was about there. two, that would have been about 200,000 light years ish away. I will say though, it was a naked eye supernova only just it was discovered by a telescope operator in chile named oscar duhalde who knew the little satellite galaxy that it appeared in so well that when he wandered out in the middle of observing one night and spotted the sector point of light he remembered oh that that's strange and when people go back and compare the times he was the first person to see that supernova wow pretty neat pretty neat yeah now yeah. You, in addition to observing massive stars, you've written a book about people observing and what goes on. Um, yes, and I have. We'd love to hear a little bit about that. So, well, first of all, what got you inspired to write a book? Um, so I, so the book is The Last Stargazers. I'll hold up the copy that I keep by my computer. And it's basically a book of behind the scenes stories of what it's like to be a professional astronomer. And where the idea came from is that it's really not hard to sell people on the idea of space and space being exciting and cool. But not a lot of people know the backstory of how we study space. They'll admire, you know, the big gorgeous pictures from Hubble, but they don't know where the pictures come from and the jobs of the people who take them. I've met people on an airplane and told them I'm an astronomer and they've said things like, oh, do you have your own telescope in your backyard? And unfortunately, Gem and I wouldn't quite fit in my backyard and you absolutely would not want to put it in Seattle. Or they'll ask, you know, do you go to Hubble personally, which again, I would love to, but I do not. Or they'll ask, how are you awake right now? If you're an astronomer, aren't you just nocturnal? And don't you just spend every night at a telescope waiting for Betelgeuse to explode or for something to happen? And when you go to an astronomy conference and talk to other astronomers about the last time you used a telescope. The conversation inevitably devolves into just like sea stories and tall tales. And did you ever hear about that guy that had a raccoon crawl into his lap at a telescope? Or did you ever hear about the telescope that got shot? Or did you hear about the guy that was observing when Mount St. Helens erupted? And all of these are true stories. And I realized that they were wonderful stories to share with people. They're sharing the tales of how we use these telescopes in an era where the technology is really rapidly changing. And to understand the stories, you learn the science along the way. So that's where the idea for the book came from. Um, well, that, that's awesome, because indeed, you're, you're absolutely right. People exchange stories, they tell tales about, you know, driving to the telescope in the middle of the night, strange metal works being laid across the highway with nobody there. How did it get there? They turn around, go back to the telescope, call some people, like, what's going on? They drive back, it's gone. <laughs> it looked like a bridge to let tanks drive across the road, by the way, was what it was. So probably in the middle of the night, the Marine Corps is like, we can't tear up the highway. We got to get the tanks from one side to the other. They were driving across and 
along came the poor astronomer on a cloudy, humid night or whatever it was and ran into this. So there's crazy stuff like that that happened. But also, um, now everybody out in our audience is going to want to know any tales of people seeing aliens or UFOs? You know, because... Oh, people, people ask me that. So I interviewed more than 100 fellow astronomers for the book, and I didn't have a single person tell me a story of spotting, first of all, definitely not aliens. Um, I did have a few stories that for a brief moment in someone's experience were unidentified flying objects, and then they promptly identified them. But astronomers, even people who, are, who stare at the night sky for their jobs, would get tricked by Venus looking really bright and diffuse on the horizon. Or they'd see a flock of geese flying high in the sky with their little white bellies lit by a setting sun, and they'd have a moment of going, what is flying? So it's very easy to think an object is unidentified, but the astronomers always quickly figured out what they were. And I did talk to people whose job um, focuses on astrobiology and on studying what life would be like on other planets. None of those fields focus on these um, other life forms visiting us. They're more focused on finding the planets where they could potentially live. Exactly. I, I, my point in all of that, you went, we did not pre-plan this. I just happened to know through speaking to lots of astronomers, none of us have ever seen a UFO. Now we've seen some things in the sky that you might be like, oh, I don't know what that is. It's Lincoln weird. But none of us leap to the conclusion that it is an alien spacecraft going across the sky. It's just, anyhow, folks, we'll have that discussion another night. But we're, we spend our lives on top of mountains in the dark, looking at the sky. And, and you'd think those would be the folks that would be seeing stuff. But maybe, you know. Anyhow, um, now, there are all sorts of tales. Would you, are, would you be so kind as to read one for us? Would you do that for our audience? I absolutely can. Um, awesome. I will now I can up. switch it forward here to um perfect first of all yeah. this telescope yes and this is a great place to start which i'll describe in a minute i'm pulling up my lovely ebook copy of okay. my book yeah. and now, i'll folks, start yep sorry well, i was just going to say as you bring that up i was going to say and I, I highly recommend folks go to your local bookstore buy a copy if you're like me and you read ebooks as well that's fine buy it from wherever you can but local bookshops could use your help so just all right bye. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll give a quick plug that the print version of the book is beautiful because I have this beautiful cover art that my publisher helped create of the Milky Way. And if you take off the dust jacket, you get a surprise because the book itself has this beautiful star field on it. So I was lucky to get an especially pretty hardcover design for the book. But I'll read the opening of the book. And I'll point out, too, that this is how my book of tales of adventures at telescopes and adventures of studying the universe opens. I wound up with a very exciting opening line. So here we go. Have you tried turning it off and back on again? This phrase repeated by weary IT specialists the world over has possibly never prompted such horror. It was one in the morning and I was sitting in a chilly control room on top of the highest mountain in Hawaii. I was nearly 14,000 feet above sea level, 24 years old, and fighting through sleep and oxygen deprivation to salvage several hard-won hours of research time for my PhD thesis on a piece of broken equipment. The equipment in question was the Subaru Telescope, a 630-ton beast housed one floor above my head in a 14-story dome. The telescope boasted a pristine primary mirror more than 27 feet in diameter the largest single piece of glass in the world. That mirror reflected starlight into a suite of some of the most sophisticated scientific instruments on the planet. It cost $47,000 per night to operate, and after submitting a 12-page science proposal to my department, I had been granted one precious night, tonight, the only night allotted to me in the entire year, to point that telescope at a handful of galaxies five billion light years away. So no, I had not tried turning it off and back on again. The evening had been going excellently until one of the control room computers had produced an unsettling blink sound, prompting the telescope operator, the only other person with me on the mountain, to freeze in her seat. When I asked her what was wrong, she explained that one of the mechanized supports holding up a mirror had just failed, but reassured me, it's okay, I think the mirror is still on the telescope. You think, I replied. Yeah, if it wasn't, we would have heard a crash. Solid reasoning, but not exactly reassuring. We'd apparently gotten lucky with how Subaru was positioned when its support mechanism failed, preventing an immediate disaster. 
For now, it was still holding up the secondary mirror, notably smaller than the enormous primary mirror, but still four feet wide, 400 pounds, and suspended 73 feet in the air, tasked with redirecting light into the camera I was using. Unfortunately, if we moved the telescope again, we risked dumping that secondary onto the floor. And that was if we were lucky. If we were unlucky, it would hit the primary on its way down. We put in a nervous call to the Subaru Day Crew, a group of engineers who worked on maintaining the 13 telescopes on the mountain during the daylight hours when the astronomers were asleep. The Japanese crew member we reached cheerfully informed us that this was probably the same error they'd seen earlier in the day. The mechanized supports were probably fine. It was probably just a false alarm, and turning the power off and on again would probably fix the problem. It seemed impolite to point out that we were talking about a multi-million dollar telescope and not a modem. I didn't know what 400 pounds of glass hitting the concrete floor above my head would sound like, but I knew I didn't want to find out. I was also quite sure I didn't want to be forever known as the grad student who killed Subaru. I'd heard too many I broke the telescope stories over the years to ignore the fact that this was a very real possibility. One of my colleagues had destroyed an outlandishly expensive digital camera on a telescope by innocently touching two of the wrong wires together. Another had slammed the business end of a telescope into a movable platform inside the dome partway through a sleep deprived night. Sometimes these sorts of failures weren't even anyone's fault. A gargantuan 300 foot wide radio telescope in West Virginia had just up and collapsed one evening, crumpling like a stepped on soda can partway through an observation. I couldn't remember exactly what had caused the infamous West Virginia failure, but I was convinced the words mechanized support and probably had been involved. The cautious thing for me to do would be to call it a night, drive back down to the observatory sleeping quarters and have the day crew carefully check things over the next morning. On the other hand, this was my only night on the telescope. Tomorrow, it wouldn't matter whether I'd experienced a mechanical failure, a false alarm, or even just a poorly timed cloud. Telescope time is strictly scheduled months in advance, and another astronomer would be arriving to use Subaru for a completely different research program. All that would matter was that my night had come and gone without completing my observations. I would have to submit a whole new proposal, hope for another hard to get yes from the telescope committee, wait an entire year until my galaxies were back up in the night sky to try again, and hope that that night wouldn't have any weather or telescope problems. And I desperately needed these galaxies. Several billion years ago, each of them had hosted a strange phenomenon known as a gamma ray burst. Astronomers thought these bursts were coming from massive, rapidly spinning, dying stars whose cores were collapsing into black holes, cannibalizing the stars from the inside out and igniting violent jets of light that came streaking through the cosmos to arrive at Earth as flashes of gamma rays lasting mere seconds. Stars died all the time, but only a handful of them were flashing us like this, and nobody could explain why. I had built my entire PhD thesis on the idea that studying the chemical makeup of these stars' home galaxies, the same gas and dust they had been born from, was the key to understanding why they exploded the way they did. Subaru was one of the only telescopes in the world capable of such observations, and the day crew had said it was probably giving me a false alarm. If I called off the night, I'd be giving up what could be my only opportunity to ever study these galaxies, losing a linchpin of my thesis research in the process. Of course, having the largest piece of glass in the world sitting in pieces on the dome floor wouldn't help matters either. I looked at the telescope operator and she looked back at me. I was the observing astronomer, so with all of my 24-year-old, third-year grad student, still had to pay the young driver fee to rent a car wisdom, this was my call. I looked at the printout of my meticulously crafted observing plan for the night, which was falling further and further behind with every minute that Subaru sat idle. I looked at the fuzzy image of the night sky on my computer screen, coming from the small guidance camera that showed us where the telescope was pointed, helping astronomers like me find our way through a bottomless sea of stars. I turned the power off and back on again. And to find out if that worked, you'll have to read the rest of the book. <laughs> Indeed, oh, now, you, now you mentioned the, the Green Bank Telescope, which is yes, this one. 
This was an exquisite 300 foot across radio telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia, and it operated for a long time. It was one of the first big, enormous radio telescopes that we ever had. And I tell the story in the book of what happened to it, that one night due to what turned out to be a very minor engineering failure, it went from this to what you'll see on the next slide, which is this. Oh, oh I skipped two that, somehow. That's there we go. Oh. So, I've read accounts of people in the middle of the night, because this did happen during nighttime observing, even though radio telescopes can observe during the day. I've read accounts of them driving back up the road and the headlights of their car just hitting this mass of twisted metal and just not even believing what they were seeing. It, yeah, uh, for, a, for a long time, it was the infamous worst telescope collapse that anybody had known about. And I published my book before Arecibo happens. But yeah. it is... It's these telescopes are exquisite and amazing scientific instruments, but as big as they are, they can be very delicate. Yeah, absolutely. Most big telescopes, they do not let the astronomers point it. We give a list of positions, a list of objects to the telescope operator, because there are places we can crash the telescope into the dome, into supports, into various things. So all the time at Keck, we had a telescope operator up at the top. We're running the instruments off on the side. Um, yeah. One of, one of my stories that scared me, I was at the Lick 3 meter, uh, Lick Observatory, just uh, east of San Jose. I was a graduate student at UCSC. And I was, uh, this was after I was a graduate student. I was at UCLA at the time as a, probably a research astronomer. I was on the 3 meter doing our program of observations and observing, observing. And out of the blue, I just messed up the control panel on the instrument. I closed a wrong window. I did something and I thought, gosh, what have I done? Right that second, as I closed it, the fire alarm went off. This horrible, the klaxon started sounding, this horrible alarm, and I just thought, that's not supposed to happen when I crashed the instrument, <laughs> because the instrument's on us. If we, if we fool out, now these were short observations, so it was no big deal. I was losing a five-minute observation, maybe. But I was immediately panicked and thought, oh my god, what have I done to the telescope? The telescope operator said, you need to exit that's the fire alarm, something's going on. And if the halon system goes off, it fills the dome with air you can't breathe, it's really bad. So I left, I go outside. The astronomer that was on what's known as the CAT, it's a little small, small telescope that's on the side of the dome, sends the light down to our huge Hamilton spectrograph down in the, the basement. She was making observations and said, oh my God, I thought it was me. I reached down to plug in a heater down below, I was cold in the control room. The second I plugged it in, these alarms started going off. So both of us thought it was us. Instead, it was the RA motor on the three meter burned out. So an electric motor that controls, that tracks the big telescope had burned out. Um, it was no big deal. It's just smoke filled this pier that was inside. They had to get the smoke in, cleared out. I thought, oh gosh, I'm done for the night probably. And I said, well, what about tomorrow? And they said, oh yeah, you'll be back tomorrow for sure. It was like a three night run or a five night run. The crew, who was also the volunteer fire department at the time up there, was also the day crew. They just went and grabbed the backup RA motor off the shelf and they went to putting it together that night. They were doing it by morning. They were like, it's back working again. You'll be fine for tomorrow night. It was amazing. The crew at Lick Observatory is just incredible, but things like that happen. You're observing in the middle of the night and all of a sudden you have alarms going off and klaxons oh, and yeah. whatever. So if you want to hear more of the good stories, be sure to pick up Emily's book, um, The Last Stargazers, and um, you're in for some really good stories, some good storytelling, and uh, enjoy it. Go to your local. Oh, hospital. definitely. I've got a, uh, I've got a copy here, and I want to give you credit here, Doctor Levesque, for the best chapter title I've ever heard in all the years I've been reading books. The chapter title, folks out there listening, is "The Harm from the Bullets Was Extraordinarily Small." That alone is enough reason to grab a book, folks. I, I've really enjoyed it. What, what really makes that chapter title excellent is I did not write it. I am quoting a report yeah. <laughs> explaining <laughs> an incident right. that happened at a telescope. The harm from the bullets was extraordinarily small. That comes right after the chapter titled Hours Lost Six Reason Volcano. Oh, so <laughs> <laughs> there's a wide spread of stories in the book. <laughs> Absolutely. Astronomer. In fact, being an astronomer for a while was one of the most dangerous professions because we would drive up a mountain, stay up all night long, and a lot of us would just drive back down the mountain if you had a one night run. So driving down a mountain early in the morning after not sleeping wasn't so safe. And then also 
it was a percentage thing. There weren't a lot of astronomers. You kill a couple of them, you've killed a large percentage of them back in the day. We're still, there aren't a lot of us these days either. So anyway, um, there anyway are, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead, I'm looking go ahead. here at the chat to see if there are any questions for you. I don't see any. So folks, if you have any questions for our guests, feel free to type them in um, and we can get to them when we will. She's gonna stay with us here for a while. But I think we're gonna, I think we should move on to the rest of our program right now and um, move on to the Sky Report. But before we do, I just wanna say round of applause again. This has been great fun chatting with you about massive stars and about your book. I look forward to being able to read it myself. Um, Chris has our department copy. I just, that's his <laughs> own copy he picked up. Um, but I want a hard copy of it, I do. I could have bought the electronic version today, but I'm gonna go down to LA's uh, The Last Bookstore and pick it up this weekend. So, and everybody should too. So um, on with the sky report. So Patrick, what is up in the sky that people can observe next month? All right, well, there's a lot of interesting uh, things to see uh, this month, uh, starting with uh, this image here, uh, showing a kind of bright dot there in the lower center there. That is the planet Venus, uh, which has been uh, with us uh, for a few months now and will be visible low in the evening sky as soon as the sun sets. Um, uh, for the rest of this month. Um, there's a, go to the next slide here. There's another picture there. You really can't miss it. In fact, if you have a view to the Southwest and you take a look out your window there, clear view, you should be able to see the planet Venus uh, roughly about 15 degrees uh, above the horizon. Now, uh, that's not all. Um, as the sky darkens, uh, we'll get a glimpse of Venus uh, on, the, on, the, on the fifth of this month and uh, right next to it, uh, roughly about uh, one and a half degrees is the bright star Spica. So the two will be close um, in, the, in the sky on the fifth. So you might wanna take a look at that and even scan that area of the sky with a pair of binoculars so you can see both Venus and the star Spica. The moon uh, also gives uh, visits uh, the vicinity of the sky where Venus is and uh, will be roughly about um, three degrees uh, from the uh, from the planet. So that's uh, something to uh, worth uh, looking for. It is a very uh, nice view and you can even take a picture of it because both objects are bright enough in the twilight sky. A lot harder to see is near the horizon and that is the planet uh, Mercury. Um, oops, I went too far, but anyway, it's kind of hard to see. It's a little bit dimmer. Uh, then uh, it's much dimmer than Venus, uh, but you, know, you need a pair of binoculars to look for it low, um, low above the uh, west there. So um, you might, that's a kind of challenge uh, for you. Um, so if you can see it, it'd be great. You're seeing the closest uh, planet to the sun in our solar system. Um, and what else do we have? We have the moon uh, and Venus. Let's see. And, and the next thing we have is uh, Saturn and, and the moon, um, which, is, uh, which occurs on the 16th. And uh, Saturn and the moon will be roughly uh, three degrees apart from each other. And that's the graphic for that one. And the moon uh, one day later will move to uh, just about four degrees below the brilliant planet uh, Jupiter. Now, this is a really great time of the year uh, to uh, observe Jupiter and Saturn uh, through a small telescope and even medium-sized telescopes. Uh, this image of Jupiter, with its great red spot, was uh, taken by Anthony Perkett, our telescope demonstrator. And you can see the kind of view you can get um, if you uh, take a photograph of it and stack up all the best pictures. You can re really get some right, uh, nice pictures of Jupiter and its cloud belts. And also the planet Saturn, which is not too far away from Jupiter. Uh, we see another picture by uh, Antony uh, with the beautiful rings, dark um, gap there is known as a Cassini division, clearly visible in this image. Uh, and you can see the cloud bands of Saturn that wrap around the entire planet. Now, if you are a person that gets up really early, uh, this is uh, a view to the southwest where we can see a whole bunch of stars that you would normally see in the winter. And uh, we're going to take a look at a few of these uh, stars and constellations. Uh, it's mainly basically a preview of the winter sky. It's also my favorite part of the sky to look at as well. And uh, we'll start with Orion the Hunter and 
there's a thumbs up for Emily for her favorite star there, which is just above three stars in a row for Ryan's belt, the star Beale Juice. There it is. So you want to go out and take a look at this gigantic, well, it's bright star, but it's, it's really a, a giant star um, in the, off in the distance there. Also, there's another giant star, which is a blue supergiant called Rigel, which, is, uh, which marks the knee of Orion Kanza. Just uh, above Orion is uh, the uh, constellation of Taurus the Bull with its bright orange star, um, Aldebaran. And to the east, uh, Castor and Pollux with uh, Gemini twins. And right above is uh, uh, Origa uh, with its uh, bright yellow star, Capella. And way down there uh, to the south is uh, Sirius, the brightest star in our night sky in the constellation of Canis Manger. So if you're up early, go ahead and uh, take a look. Um, if not, you can wait for a few months and they will be uh, migrating into the evening sky. Now, it's kind of still summer right now, but Summer comes to an end on the 22nd, uh, and this coincides with the day of the autumnal equinox, which occurs at 12.21 p.m. Uh, PDT, and this is the, where the sun is located exactly on the celestial equator, or if you can imagine it, the Earth's equator projected into the sky. From Los Angeles, local noon occurs at 12.46 uh, p.m. PDT, where the sun is uh, about 56 degrees above the due south horizon. And from there on, the sun will move uh, gradually uh, south and a little bit lower in the sky each day. So the days grow shorter, the nights grow longer until we reach the uh, winter solstice in December. The uh, beginning of autumn is uh, marks, is actually occurs in the Northern hemisphere. But at the same time, for those folks in the Southern hemisphere, spring begins, it's the spring equinox down there. So kind of the opposites of uh, seasons. We'll be um, actually celebrating the arrival of autumn uh, with a YouTube event, uh, which we'll be streaming. We'll be streaming local noon. And um, also when the sun sets, we'll uh, uh, stream the moment of sunset from uh, Griffith Zotari's uh, West uh, Terrace. So please join us on YouTube for both of these events. Uh, both events are posted on our uh, YouTube site. Okay, so finally, the moon phases for this month. Uh, new moon is on the 6th. Um, go down here. Uh, first quarter is the 13th. Full moon is the uh, 20th, which is the harvest moon. And last quarter is the 28th. And that's your sky report for this month. So go out and enjoy the night sky. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. Thank you for that, Patrick. Um, always something to see up in the night skies. And my favorite thing is that it's still summer. Okay, joking in the chat. <laughs> folks were saying they couldn't wait for summer to end. It's been hot for a lot of folks. Um, but there, are, there are still a few more weeks. Summer doesn't officially end until the 22nd. Do come join our celebration. I want to turn to just a couple of uh, the questions that came in the chat for Emily before we go on out to lunch. Um, one question was, are you going to do the read for the audio book? because people evidently quite enjoyed your read. Is that a possibility? So the audiobook is already recorded. Um, I would have loved to read it, but we got a wonderful narrator named Janet Metzger to record it. Um, and you can now buy the audiobook um, wherever you buy books. Um, if, if, if I can plug one more project of mine, though, if people did want to hear me talk more about science, um, I recently released a series for The Great Courses um, titled Great Heroes and Discoveries of Astronomy. So you can get a little DVD copy or you can just stream it. And it's the stories of some of the big discoveries we've seen in astronomy and the people who made them, including um, there's a lecture that talks in part about um, Carolyn Shoemaker, who I know we'll be talking about a little later tonight. Very, very nice. Excellent. Um well, one question we had that I can answer, someone wanted to know how stars can grow if, um, how a massive star can grow. I think they were talking about it with so much energy coming out of it, and that's absolutely a limit. Um, an astronomer named Eddington, if my memory goes back to it, Eddington limit, you balance the radiation coming off of it with the material trying to fall on, and eventually the star will get hot enough, energetic enough, the winds are strong enough, you just stop that accretion. Now, earlier, 
before all these supernovae made all these heavy elements, you could make bigger stars. You could make more massive stars because the light can leave hydrogen and helium easier than it can leave an atmosphere that's sprinkled with iron and calcium and all these other elements that make it hard for the light to leave. So it's a very good question. So Emily, I'm gonna modify the question a little. What is the most massive star that could be formed today, given that there's all these heavier elements that kind of stop it from forming? Oh, we argue about this. In yeah, I know. That's why I put you on the spot. Right around, we are right around about 100 to 300-ish times the mass of our sun. Um, we'll often run models simulating how stars of different masses um, go through their lives. And a lot of times the biggest mass we'll simulate is about 120, 150. There's individual stars that people think they might have found that are more massive. But like you said, it gets hard to keep stars like this stable. I will yeah. point out that the star I mentioned when we were talking, Eta Carina, that star that had faked its own death and done something that looked like a supernova, Stars like that, we think, might do those sort of weird death throws because they're approaching the Eddington limit. And the way that I describe this to my students is it's like they are shining themselves apart. And in a sort of last ditch effort to stay stable, we think they might puff off all that mass to stay okay. Now, this is still hotly debated, but it gets right at that sort of limit of how massive and how luminous stars can get. Interesting. Fantastic. Although I do have to admit that was a very astronomer thing to do to give a factor of three error in the hundred to three hundred. We're pinning it down any day now. That's in astronomy. Good. That's absolutely the same yeah. number. It absolutely <laughs> is. It's just so hundred ish. Yeah. 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 So anybody that wants to know, are we really speaking astronomer astronomer tonight? We sure are. We're go, we're going full full blown. Um, one <laughs> last question. Somebody want to know: Can planets be seen in New York? They sure can. Absolutely. Planets are some of the stuff we observe at Griffith Observatory. Downtown LA, the lights of Hollywood, they don't bother us at all. New York, as long as skies are clear and you know where to look, sure, absolutely, you can see them. So Chris, let's turn to you and go on with our out to launch segment. So, but great questions, folks. Love, love getting them in the chat. If you aren't a YouTube member, join and you can chat with us. And I also uh, just want to take a moment to just thank everybody that's having a great time in there. I really do appreciate all the, all the fun folks are having. But Chris, speaking of fun, um, yeah, was it, a, was it a fun month in terms of launches? Let's just do our out to launch. Uh, it, it was. <laughs> we had a lot going on. Uh, to, to give you a quick rundown, of what's going on in the world of space? Uh, well, first of all, we've had a launch. That not all launches are the same. <laughs> launches can be different sometimes. I've seen some very different launches, but I've never seen anything quite like the journey undertaken by this little rocket, a small orbital rocket. Um, the Astra LV0006 uh, is about to do something unusual, not only that it's launching from Alaska, Kodiak Island in Alaska, it's an unusual launch site, uh, but beyond that, this private company that's designed this vehicle, they're testing it uh, with this and a couple of previous attempts to get into space, uh, but this time when they ignited the uh, engines, uh, which we ended up getting was something, well, like this. Now, I'll repeat that a couple times, and you at home may be able to detect something unusual. The rocket does not go in the direction we technically call up. It, in fact, goes sideways off the launch pad, hovering. Now, what's happened here is that one of the rocket's engines has cut out. So it doesn't have enough lift to get itself moving upward very fast. Instead, it's balancing. And that's a very hard thing to do and going sideways. In fact, it left the launch complex, which has a chain link fence around it. Fortunately, someone left the chain link fence gate open because it left through the gate. Now, as for what happens next, I have my own ideas about what I wish happened next. I wish that rocket had gotten out, had a chance to see the countryside, enjoyed the Alaskan wildlife, and maybe stopped by Kodiak Island town and got a Starbucks and KFC, hit the beach, live a little bit. Um, this rocket did not do that, which is kind of unfortunate as far as I'm concerned, it'd be funny. What it actually did is something you're not expecting. When a launch literally goes sideways, instead, it straightened out and flew. The guidance software was so good. In fact, despite the excitement here, the company's president congratulated his team because what they'd done was design guidance software that was good enough to hold that rocket upright 
until it could get going. Now, unfortunately, it didn't make it all the way into space, made it up about 43 kilometers before they ended up having to call a halt to it because it used up too much fuel doing its sideways slide and there was an engine out. But really, although it was exciting, my compliments to the Astra team. Well done for a first attempt, and they'll try again. Now, a team that's been having a lot of success lately is SpaceX, and SpaceX has done a delivery uh, using their uh, Cargo Dragon spacecraft to send uh, cargo, about 4,000 pounds, up to the International Space Station. This is a picture of the Dragon approaching the space station. Uh, kind of a fun thing. Uh, of course, there's 4,000 odd pounds of supplies up there, which is really a present for the crew, but just as a fun thing for you, it's literally a present for astronaut Megan MacArthur. Megan MacArthur's birthday was that day, and she told Mission Control she was uh, she'd never had anyone send her a spaceship for her birthday. So I thought that was very nice. Uh, happy picture there of the crew, both the cosmonauts and the astronauts on board the International Space Station. On a little bit more serious note, something we're watching here, you'll remember last month we talked about the uh, anomalous docking of the uh, Nauka module, the Russian module with the space station that put some twisting uh, motion into the space station and everything stable now. But uh, in an inspection, uh, some of the Russian cosmonauts have found some cracking, uh, little bits of cracking in the Zarya module. That's the uh, service module for the space station and was in fact the very first of all the space station modules uh, launched up in 1998. Uh, now, they don't think this is related to the problems that they just had. They think instead these are just signs of age. And it's hard for us to remember 1998. That was a long time ago. The space station is getting older. People are talking about replacing it with a new station. So uh, watching and maintaining this uh, sort of thing with the space station as it gets older is something the crews are definitely doing. It's something to keep an eye on as we go forward. Um, already mentioned the dragon. Well, here's a different kind of dragon. Uh, this dragon is not the cargo dragon, it's the crew dragon, but it's not going to the ISS. Instead, this is going on a three-day Earth orbital mission without going to the space station. That's actually important. If you look carefully at that picture, you'll see the ship's nose has a little bubble on it. It has a, uh, a viewing dome on the front. And that is to allow a crew of four private citizens, not professional astronauts. They are going to fly on a mission they call Inspiration 4. Uh, and this is a mission that's been privately funded. Um, their, their spacecraft has been modified to give them this dock, not docking, but viewing uh, portal uh, to help them enjoy the flight. This is the very first time a private all civilian uh, orbital space flight has ever occurred. Um, here's a picture of the crew in one of the uh, aircraft doing those ballistic arcs um, to uh, simulate zero gravity. And you can see the crew here training. Uh, I do want to make the point that the crew here is actually, uh, they're not professional astronauts, but they're, they are getting quite a bit of training. Um, now, Mr. Uh, Isaacson over there on your extreme left, he actually uh, put the money up for this flight. He paid for it, uh, quite a wealthy man, uh, but he was also a jet pilot. So he has experience and he's been undertaking a lot of training. He can assume the controls and so forth and assist in emergencies. The other people were chosen uh, from, by him essentially to uh, promote the St. Jude's Medical Research Hospital for Children. And in fact, uh, uh, Haley there, you see, uh, third from left, uh, she was a cancer survivor who went on to work at the hospital there. So all, all of these folks will be uh, raising money for the hospital through the publicity for this space mission. So I encourage you to keep an eye out for it. Uh, it's not a science mission, but Inspiration4, very interesting. Scheduled for launch now, September 15th. So we're coming right up on it. Uh, boy, talk about astronomy, talk about telescopes, the James Webb Telescope. Uh, after all of its difficulties over the years, I mean, it's an amazing instrument, uh, but it's had a, a history of some challenges and cost overruns and things like that. Well, it looks like we got it solved 
and the most awaited telescope ever in astronomy is now ready to take flight on an Ariane rocket and begin hopefully a very long career. People are really waiting for this telescope. It has been folded up in California where it has been assembled and it is going to make its trip to its launch site. But it's gonna have to do that on the sea because it's being assembled in the area of Los Angeles and its launch site is in French Guiana in South America. Okay, so to get from there to there, it's going to have to go through the Panama Canal and through that little ocean in the middle, the Caribbean. And if Caribbean makes you think of things like this, well, that's not entirely out of the question, they are keeping the date secret for when it's transiting through that area. Uh, and of course, they're taking security precautions. It's a very expensive instrument, and it's going to be under guard, obviously, all the way. A lot's riding on this. We got to keep this thing safe. So after all the challenges we've had getting this amazing telescope ready, I can promise you it's going to get there safely. We are putting it on the safest ship imaginable. There is no way anything could possibly go wrong. I'm having a little fun with you there, folks. I think we are through our problems now, and we're going to get that telescope to its launch site now. Uh, coming coming up soon, end of the year. Um, as far as what's going on down to Boca Chica, Texas, uh, the gigantic Starship rocket, lots more going on. They've been uh, working on the launch tower, installing its systems. They're doing uh, heat shield work on the spacecraft. They're working on the booster. They're getting everything ready. Yeah, that work's gonna take uh, about another month, something like that. But then there's also the question of the Federal Aviation Administration that regulates space flight uh, for these folks. Um, we have to get FAA approval to launch this rocket. Please remember, this is a rocket the size of a Saturn V. So there may be a few meetings on this. Anyway, that's what's going on. The World of Space uh, launches right now. Uh, back to you, Dr. Reitzel. Wow, just, you know, watching that Starship launch is going to be it's going to be crazy. I can't wait to see them launch that thing. I'm I haven't seen a rocket that big since I was eight years old. Yeah, Since I was eight years old, we have not launched a rocket that big. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy, and I want to know how many of those tiles are going to fall off because I bet they will. Uh, it'll take them a while to figure out exactly how to get them mounted. But anyway, um, interesting stuff. I can't wait to see what keeps happening with this commercial space flight stuff. You know, it's it, it's just crazy thinking we've reached an era finally where the space tourism is no longer just a you know, a media stunt. It, it right. felt like about a decade ago, we saw these things happening. The Russians were selling seats up on Soyuz to the space station, but that was really kind of a media stunt. They were raising some money. This feels for real. People are going up, they have a dome built, the spacecraft, It's this is some neat stuff. So um, I can only hope that these exceptionally rich people also think about the good they could do um, with some other things. And I'm very happy to see that this flight is raising money for a hospital and for and for research. So let's hope they raise more money than the cost of the flight. That's that's what I hope happens. Um, so but awesome. yeah, and, and you know, thinking about good things that way, at least they have their heart in the right place as they're taking their ride. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, and now it's time to turn to some, you know, beautiful pictures uh, with Katie. Thank you. Um... There you are. Hi. Um, so this first picture is over at Griffith Observatory. Um, this is from Monday morning. I took a hike. And then this morning I took the exact same hike. And hopefully you can see this amazing cloud layer that completely hides the observatory. Hmm. Oh, well, that is pretty. This is about uh, just before 730 this morning. And there's the Hollywood sign hmm. peeking out there. And this beautiful image is from astrophotographer Blake Estes is um, the fighting dragons. And the Dumbbell Nebula, this is from David Pinsky, who just took these images last night from Josh Littree. And the Veil Nebula. And then a gorgeous picture of the Andromeda Galaxy. And finally, the Pleiades from David Pinsky. And this image is from Todd uh, 
Unioka, uh, I hope I pronounced uh, your last name correctly. And this is from Joshua Tree as well. Jupiter is that bright star and a bright looking star <laughs> planet. Um, and then you can see face rock on the left there. And there's also Saturn to the right of Jupiter. Another one from Todd of Milky Way. And here we have the Perseids from the ISS. Beautiful image. And a couple more Perseids here. This one's from Justin Foley. And then telescope demonstrator Anthony Perfect took this one. And then you can see the Andromeda Galaxy mm -hmm. in this one as well. Another beautiful image from Anthony Perkett. This is the Swan Nebula. And the double cluster NGC 869 and 884. And this is a 30 minute time lapse star trail um, exposure around North Star Polaris. And then this one is an image of planet Saturn. This was taken by Ella Ritz, who uh, is a staff member at Griffith Observatory. And this was her first image, um, astrophotography image that she took. Um, and she took this just through a telescope with her cell phone. So you too can take astrophotography images with just your phone through a telescope. And for comparison, um, this is Saturn through our Zeiss telescope at Griffith Observatory from one of our telescope demonstrators, Vanessa. And on to some weather. These beautiful clouds are Mimatis clouds. Um, and this was taken in Canada from Michael Johnston. And these are rare clouds that are little pouches that um, generally form after a storm. And on to our sun. This is our live image from today from our coelostat at Griffith Observatory. And there's not too much going on. There is a sunspot. I don't know if you can spot it on the left there. There's a circle around that. Uh, sunspot AR2863. Um, and that poses a slight um, class C um, solar flares, but little to no um, consequences for Earth from that. So although there's not too much going on, I still included our aurora forecast. Um, but you can see there a very quiet, um, quiet time for our sun. Very quiet time. Well, thank you for that, Katie, and an interesting space weather report and beautiful astronomical images as always. Now, folks, a lot of those pictures were taken by staff members of Griffith Observatory. Um, Todd is a staff member, Anthony's a staff member, um, David Pinsky is, uh, Blake Estes will never, will never for forget, forgive you. He was a staff member, but we shan't speak of it ever again. No, Blake's wonderful. He's off at the AAT now in Australia. So watch out for the kangaroos or you'll have stories to tell Emily. <laughs> um, in fact, there are stories of astronomers getting back to their room after a long night of observing and there's a roo right in front of their door and they're like, just let me go to bed. <laughs> let me go to bed. And the kangaroo's like, nope. Nope, you gotta box me. So <laughs> they had to go get help to get the king removed because they could be mean. Um, so anyway, Blake, we miss you, but beautiful photographs. Um, and now we're gonna get all those beautiful Southern Hemisphere images from Blake. So we're covering the globe now with All Space Considered. But if you have a beautiful astronomical image and you wanna send it to us, tweet it at us, um, send it to us at All Space Considered at Yahoo. Dot com. We got to get a, a, a new, get rid of the Yahoo, I think. But anyway, moving on, moving on. Um, you know, uh, we're going to celebrate, and Bill, I think you're with us somewhere in here. Uh, Bill's going to join us to talk about and honor astronomer Carolyn Shoemaker, who recently passed away. Um, I was lucky enough to meet her at the very first conference I ever went to. Well, I was in, right out of undergraduate before I went to graduate school. I was at um, Lowell Observatory, and first conference I ever well, I worked at it. I got to pour drinks and run slide projectors and things like that. Yeah, there were slide projectors then, but it was comets, asteroids, and meteors. And um, she was there and I got to meet her and I was, I thought it was pretty great. I was a little starstruck to meet the shoemakers. But uh, Bill, 
you know, why, why are we celebrating Carolyn Shoemaker and uh, why should folks remember her? And I, I obviously agree we should. Yes, there's so much to, uh, to celebrate about this, this human being. I, the more I researched her, the, the more I regretted that I didn't have your opportunity to, to actually meet her and speak with her. Um, this is a, a woman who, as a child, had zero interest in science. This is, she admits this herself, admitted this herself. Um, she did end up uh, getting a couple of master's degrees in, in history and political science. Um, she married a scientist, a geologist, uh, Dr. Eugene Shoemaker. Um, she helped him in the field a bit. They had three kids. All the kids went off to college eventually. Now she's 50, 51 year old, uh, one years old and, and has nothing to do. And her husband uh, at the time was working, uh, I believe, in a program at Caltech that uh, was searching for asteroids. They were looking for, for potentially hazardous objects. And um, he hired her in as a research assistant, even though she had zero um, background in, in physical sciences. And it turned out she had a real talent for this. Uh, they would use the, um, uh, this, um, what was it, 18 inch? Yeah, 18 inch Schmidt telescope at Palomar Observatory. Uh, photograph stuff all night, the sky all night, patches the sky. And then uh, she would take the, uh, the stereoscopic viewer and look for little tiny movements of anything, a little dot in the sky that moved a little faster than the stars. And that's how you find uh, things like comets and asteroids. She ended up finding uh, over 32, let me get that number to be correct here. Um, yeah, over 32 comets and uh, various different sources uh, talk about how many asteroids. But uh, Sky and Telescope says over 800 asteroids she identified. They worked together. They would photograph all night. He would develop the film. It was, you know, you had to develop the film in those days. Um, but she did the actual looking, and she got supposedly really, really good from all sources on this. Okay, so then they have uh, occasionally uh, collaborated with another uh, comet hunter by the name of David Levy. That's why there's so many Shoemaker-Levy uh, um, comets that were discovered. Shoemaker-Levy 9 is the one that's really, really uh, important. In fact, um, and by the way, in this picture here, she's standing in front of that 18-inch Schmidt telescope at uh, Palomar, and her husband took this picture. But you can, I don't know if you can see all the way on the left side of the frame, and this is a composite picture. They shot two different things and put them together, but this is basically what happened. A comet uh, that had been orbiting Jupiter was ripped apart by its tidal forces into, I think, 21 different pieces flew off into space. And then, of course, Jupiter's immense gravity pulled them back in and they collided with the atmosphere of uh, Jupiter. They knew this was going to happen because of their work in, in identifying uh, this, uh, these objects. So it was the first time that we ever got to watch live impacts in our solar system. We knew this was going to happen. It happened. We got to record it. We got to learn from it. Um, you can see in the, the picture in the middle there, some of the scars that were left in the atmosphere of Jupiter. Some of those are Earth-sized, I just want to say. They're, they're really big scars. If that thing had hit us, we would not be having all space considered tonight. <laughs> um, so that's, that stuff is all, of course, really, really important. Um, she got all kinds of, of medals and, and awards and things. The James Craig Watson Medal, NASA gave her an Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal. Rittenhouse Medal Scientist of the Year, just on and on and on. Not bad for somebody who really had no, had actual disdain for science in her youth uh, and really made some serious, important uh, scientific contributions with her, uh, her brilliant talent for spotting objects in space. I regret that she's gone. Thank you, Bill, for bringing that uh, beautiful summary of, of her work and her life. And indeed, um, you know, the two made a great, paired together of researchers but yeah. honestly the work she did of going and finding them and having those school those skills might have been a little harder than the taking of the images i, I hate to say it i don't want to despair yeah, well, it at all because again they were a pair but the, it yeah. really takes skill to see that little dot that's moving in that sea yeah. of stars that's really hard we have automated routines that can do it these days but that's that's the tough part so she hey, deserves all the honors just one last thing. I always look for a little quote from the person. And my favorite quote that she, from her is that uh, somebody asked her, what does it feel like to discover a new comet? She said, I want to dance. <laughs> I just thought uh, that was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So. Anyway, and uh, folks still try and go out there and discover comets. You're competing mm -hmm. against big sky surveys this, this, at this mm -hmm. time. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, comets, believe it or not, have a connection to our next, our next story. And we're going to talk about um, the Perseids and meteors.
And there's a connection between comets and meteors, and we'll get to that later. But this is a time-lapse photo, and you can see what looks like sort of a, a spray, a shower of meteors coming down towards us. You can imagine it. This, this photo was probably taken over, oh gosh, if there's you know, 30, 40 meteors up there, this could be maybe an hour of time. Um, so you'll see maybe one meteor a minute was about normal for the Perseids. Um, here's a bright Perseid crossing the sky. Sometimes they're very bright and sort of flash at the end. Uh, I was out observing them with, in fact, some of our, uh, our crew here. We all went out to Joshua Tree and we saw some great ones. And one of them, in fact, did explode like at the, that at the end and got a very bright flash. Uh, you can see color in them sometimes. And they'll even leave behind trails that'll glow in the sky for a while. And I love this picture where you see, I believe that's Andromeda there. It sure looks like it. Um, I have to go and identify other stars around it. Oh yeah, that is. Um, so just amazing photograph here of another Perseid. Um, again, here there's a nova marked in this one, which is fun. So there's a nova, which is a star that's a white dwarf that's suddenly gotten brighter. It's had some nuclear reactions on its surface. There's also some sprites in this photograph, those sort of orangey looking things, I believe, or sprites probably above those thunderstorms. So this is a really remarkable image, including a Perseid. Um, this one here, uh, again, oh, they almost look like they're converging at a location too, which they will. If they come from a radiant, they'll converge on the far side. So this photo captured that, although I love the umbrella and the, the gown as well. It's just a very art, artful picture. And then here we look at it and see, again, the Milky Way, they appear to be coming from a certain direction. This is just a beautiful picture of a Perseids. Now you need to go to dark sites to see the Perseid meteors. And one of our very own uh, foundation employees, Nikki, who's here with us tonight, I think we're just going to keep bringing in the guests every once in a while. Um, but Nikki, are you there to join us? Yeah, hi. Thanks. Yeah, there you are. Hi. Um, Nikki helps, um, helps run our foundation on a day-to-day -day basis. And she and I coordinate things together to make sure the events and plans all work out and things happen. And she told me that she went out to a dark location to see the Perseids. Now you might think, oh, did you go to Joshua Tree? Did you go out in the desert? No, Nikki, you actually went to New England. Yes. You went all the way, you went all the way to Maine <laughs> to, to watch. The, the, yeah, the I was in the, the great North Woods of Maine. It was really, really special and, um, in part because of where I work, I knew to look for something unique. And um, I had learned that the International Dark Sky Association had just certified a dark sky park, um, much to the credit of the Appalachian Mountain Club. And they were um, open to property just this year um, that we were able to visit. And it was really, wow. really special. So, so very fun. So you actually went to the dark sky park because we talked about these things. So folks, celebrate these dark sky parks. They won't stay dark sky parks unless people go to them and embrace them. And you don't go there and set up a bunch of lights around your campsite. The idea is to celebrate the dark and to see the skies. Now, you were watching Perseids and you happen to have this one that made the news. If you notice here, this is a main website. A fireball spotted over New England Friday night. The meteor's path was over central Maine, more than 85 reports of sightings. Yeah. Now, this meteor, however, was not a Perseid. It was very no. bright. But yes. what, how do you know it wasn't a Perseid? Um, because of where we were looking in the sky. So we, um, Maine is one of those places where if you don't like the weather, you can just wait five minutes and it will change. <laughs> so we had made sure to schedule ourselves a couple nights. So we were sure to get a nice, um, you know, ob observing opportunity. And this was our first night there. And as soon as it was dark, I ran outside and it was complete cloud cover. There was not a star to be seen. Um, so we stayed up, you know, playing cards and drinking tea. And um, before we decided to turn it, just pop back out. And it was spectacular, still partially cloudy. So it was a little bit of drama, um, you know, and kind of following where the best observing was. So we just happened to not be looking um, in the direction of the Perseids. And um, this fireball just lit up the sky. And um, I think because it was partially cloudy too, it was almost like a lightning kind of, I mean, it really just lit everything up and we were just so astonished. And um, we're also on this property where there's no Wi-Fi, there's no cell service. So I just took my little notes, um, you know, about the time and what I saw, you know, and um, the direction we were looking in. And when we emerged from the woods and after a couple of days, uh, I looked it up and um, was so excited to see it was newsworthy and um, that we'd really, you know, it was actually as special as it felt in the moment. 
Yeah, so you said wrong place in the sky. So that's very interesting. That implies mm -hmm. something about the Perseids that we'll hear about in a little bit. But before we turn back to our meteors, we're going to talk about our inquiries from the foundation. And Nikki's the one that helps pass these along to us. And we did have a question that we dug up. And the idea behind this is our foundation members, by the way, you could join the foundation if you like what you're hearing tonight. Um, you could become a member. Nikki will tell you about how to do that. But we also like to take a question from those members and answer it. So did you have that question or did I sneak that past you, by the way? I managed to get it from Yes, Katie. we have um, a question from Connie Elliott. Um, I'm so excited because she's not only a member, but a longtime volunteer. And she asks, is it too late for a ninth planet discovery in my lifetime? Ninth planet discovery, is it too late? Well, the answer to that is no, it's not too late. In fact, there are there's some evidence that there may be a ninth planet out there well beyond Neptune. Um, when we look at the distribution of dwarf planets out by Pluto, so Pluto, Eris, Makemake, Maki, others, it turns out they're not distributed quite randomly. It looks like there's been something else that's influenced the way they're orbiting. And in fact, where they have the closest approach, it looks like something gravitational has tipped the gravity they're dealing in. And uh, Mike Brown and Constantine, the I can never say his name. Sorry, Constantine. Anyway, they did the math. They did the statistics and said there's something out there pulling on them. And it's probably a Neptune or larger planet very far away. It might have an elliptical orbit and it, they're looking for it. They thought they might have found it by now. And it turns out there is a um, there was an article just yesterday that came out. Um, I don't don't know if we had this one. Did we get it in here? Yes, we did. So there's the question. And um, I pulled this in just a little bit ago. This came out from National Geographic just a couple of days ago, an article by Nadia Drake, who happens to be the daughter of Frank Drake, famous radio astronomer, um, was a professor of mine at UCSC. Um, she's a terrific author, writes about science. And she says, planet nine may be closer and easier to find than thought if it exists. Now I'll leave it up to you to go read that article. I don't wanna steal things from National Geographic, we'll get in trouble. But the upshot is that perhaps it is maybe hidden in that swath of the Milky Way stars. Maybe it's in there somewhere and it could be there. There's places they haven't looked um, and it's possible it might be there. So very, very interesting and, and a lot of fun, very cool. Um, so Nikki, how can folks join our foundation if they have a question and they want us to talk about it live on the next All Space Considered? Yeah, I'll drop links into the chat um, so you can visit and join. And then in addition to a lot of other fun perks and benefits, um, once a month we put out a portal pass email, um, which has the form to submit your questions so you could be part of the show and lots of other fun stuff and exclusive content. Um, so thank you guys so much for having me. I am so proud to work in the service of this organization. and members get to join us in that. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming and joining us tonight and your story about seeing a fireball that wasn't a Perseid while you were out observing Perseids. Um, but a lot of fun. Every time you go out and observe the sky, something fun happens, whether it's satellites you see or uh, bring a telescope with you and look at Saturn or Jupiter, but get out and observe, observe the skies. It's, it's pretty great. Um, now, Patrick, we've been talking about meteor showers. We've been talking about um, comets. We've been talking about asteroids and all sorts of things tonight, but what's the connection between them? Why do they happen certain times of year? Why does why are these meteors appear to be coming from a certain direction or a radiant, as we say? Um, what do you have for us? I know you, you've prepared some things to explain this, all of this to us. Yeah, sure. Um, we'll go to uh, this uh, table here. Uh, this uh, basically is a list of uh, some of the major meteor showers that you can see throughout the year. And uh, one of the strongest uh, amongst them is, of course, we just talked about is the Perseid meter shower. On the right hand side there, you can see there's a parent body associated with each of these uh, meter showers and the Perseid uh, uh, meter shower, the parent body associated is Comet Swift-Tuttle. It's a comet. It's a huge comet um, with a nucleus of about 16 miles, uh, 16 miles across and is much larger than Halley's Comet, which is roughly about nine by five uh, miles across. And uh, this image was taken uh, when it was last close to the sun back in 1992, just over 30 years ago uh, when it uh, passed by. Now, why do we 
what happens during a meteor shower? Well, uh, these uh, comets uh, leave uh, trails of dust um, as they uh, go uh, by the sun and in its orbit. And each uh, year, uh, we pass through, for the Perseids at least, uh, we, uh, the Earth, passes through uh, the densest part of the trail and uh, we get a maximum that occurs usually on the on the night of the August 11th through to the morning of the uh, 13th, uh, 12th. And we're, we're basically, the, 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 the Earth is uh, plowing through this uh, uh, trail of dust uh, left by Comet Swift-Tuttle. Now, the uh, dust particles themselves uh, can be as big as uh, grains of sand and uh, much uh, smaller than that. And they literally uh, hit the Earth's atmosphere at speed of 100,000 miles per hour, which is incredible speed, so fast that friction with the, Earth, with the air causes them to glow. So you get this plasma that forms uh, the glowing plasma around these particles. And that light from that plasma is the light that you see as a meteor, which only lasts for a brief moment, a few seconds or less. And the other part of it is uh, they come from a certain part of the sky. Now, um, I should say, okay, well, before we get to that part, part uh, they come from a certain part of the sky and this is uh, caused by the Earth's directional direction of travel in its orbit around the sun, uh, which makes the meteors appear uh, to radiate from the uh, constellation of Perseus, hence the name uh, Perse uh, the Perseus, because that's uh, the name that the shower is named after from where the constellation um, they radiate from. So they can radiate uh, from uh, all directions and all across the sky. So if you're watching a Perseus, you don't normally have to look uh, directly at the radiant. It, the, the, basically, the meteors are uh, all over the sky. You can look anywhere in the sky uh, to catch a Perseus. Now, uh, this year's shower, um, was actually documented uh, with this graph here. The vertical scale represents um, ideal conditions of how many meters a single observer can, can see uh, per hour. And during the peak, uh, usually it's uh, the, the 11th through to the uh, 12th. Um, in this uh, table here, uh, actually this graph, you can see uh, roughly uh, there was a peak kind of roughly around the, um, uh, the 13th and the 14th, which is in the universal time, which is kind of corresponds to uh, our time here on the Pacific coast. Uh, and the rates were roughly kind of normal, uh, roughly about uh, 60 to 70 meteors uh, per, uh, per, hour, uh, per hour in the clear dark skies. Now, um, something amazing happened uh, this year. Um, if people were staying uh, kind of in, in the national park and stayed a little bit longer, they actually could witness uh, about 1 a.m. on the 14th of uh, August, a outburst, an unusual outburst um, from the Perseids, uh, which brought the numbers up to uh, close to 150 meteors per hour, which is amazing. So uh, that was a bonus uh, for this year, uh, which of course we don't know because uh, usually the uh, the trail of dust is it has a uh, it is not always evenly dis distributed. So uh, the Earth uh, just uh, happened to run into a dense clump of dust at that time. Now, the other major meteor shower um, in the year uh, occurs at the end of this year, which is the uh, Gemini meteor shower on the night of the 13th and the 14th, which is its uh, peak. And uh, the parent body associated with this uh, meteor shower is, a, um, is actually an asteroid. Um, its name is 3200 Phaeton, and uh, it's a small object, an actually an asteroid, uh, roughly about 3.6 miles across. And this is a radar image uh, taken by the Arecibo Observatory. Uh, it's a really hard object to see because it's so small. And um, it has an orbit that takes it uh, very close to the sun. Uh, to the sun closer than Mercury's orbit, where it uh, outgasses. And the recent studies have shown that um, it, it gets uh, really hot when it's close to the sun and outgasses uh, sodium. And that may uh, kind of, and also some of the rock may vaporize and vent into space. 
uh, causing it to brighten like a comet uh, when it's close to the sun, and even dislodge uh, pieces of rocky uh, debris as it moves uh, around the sun. The interesting thing is that um, all of this debris um, will eventually um, intersect uh, with the kind of Earth's orbit. Here's the orbit of uh, this uh, uh, asteroid, which only completes its orbit in uh, 1.4 years compared to Swift Tuttle, which has a period of 133 years. And you can, see, I'll play that game. There it goes. Um, we can see that there has the asteroid coming in, and right there um, on December 13, 14 is uh, where the Earth actually intersects the the trail of. Uh, of this asteroid, and that's where we see the uh, the burst of meteors for its maximum at that time. Looking into the uh, area of the sky uh, where the meteors radiate from, um, they radiate from uh, a position uh, just uh, above the above Gemini twins. And uh, mark your calendars uh, for this year. Um, the uh, observing is is okay uh, this year uh, for the 13th through the morning of the 14th. Um, the moon will be up, uh, but it will set at uh, 2.45 um, uh, Pacific Daylight, Pacific Standard Time. And uh, so uh, after that time, uh, the sky will be dark enough to uh, see these uh, meteors. So uh, I mark that down on your calendar. Um, they produced 150 meters per hour in uh, ideal conditions, so a lot higher than the Perseids. Don't re don't shut off the computer, Patrick. I think something's happened to the. There it goes. All right, we're oh, back okay. on track now, folks. At least I think we are. You able to advance your slides? Let me see. There you go. Yep. So no technical now, glitch. Yeah. Now um, I, I wasn't sure what the next one was. This one actually introduces our next subject with Chris Butler. Chris, what are we seeing here? What you're looking at there is the buildup of satellites that are being tracked in Earth orbit since 1957, when there was only one. As the years have gone by, Sputnik was joined by dozens, hundreds, thousands of satellites uh, up there in space. And you may wonder, rightly, if there's some possibility of things actually smashing into each other. Now, space is very big, and satellites are not very big compared to that, so it's rare. The last time it happened with a fairly large smash up was in the year 2009, but it seems to have happened again. We just wanna call attention to that because uh, space debris, uh, space collisions, that is something that we're looking at uh, addressing eventually. We know it's, it's an increasing problem. Um, this is just an illustration, not a, not a real picture of a satellite collision there. These happen very far away. We find out about them uh, when we lose communications with the satellite, for example, or when radar from the earth tracks suddenly your one satellite now seems to be a hundred little satellites and they're moving away from each other. Well, what had what just recently happened in March is that a Chinese satellite uh, 700 kilometers up, that's how high it was, a fairly high orbit, but not all the way out with the geosynchronous satellites that are much farther. Um, this Chinese satellite uh, began to experience some problems they, they started tracking about 40 new objects around the satellite. And at the same time, uh, the US Space Force, who that's a big part of their mission, they're the ones tracking this stuff. They noticed that a spent rocket stage, a Russian rocket stage passed very close to that position at the exact moment all these new objects appeared around the Chinese satellite. Uh, so there probably was a collision there. Um, interestingly, though, the Chinese satellite is not destroyed. They've been able to control it 
since then, making changes to its orbit. So it looks like it got nicked instead of a full uh, smash up there, but it is something we're gonna have to be watching in the future with other satellites. The uh, debris up in space generated by these, remember one satellite getting hit, that can generate thousands of pieces of debris. And while it is not as crowded as it is in this artist's conception, there's everything up there from nuts, bolts, uh, a flex of paint even, moving that fast. If they hit something like the International Space Station, the space shuttles were hit a number of times in different ways, not fatally, not a serious problem, but it's something we really have to be careful and concerned about. We're looking at ways eventually to clean them up, to deorbit them and so forth. That's technology we don't have yet, but the space crash we just had is a reminder this is on our cosmic to-do list. Uh, back to you, Dr. Wrightson. Excellent. Um, well, wonderful. It looks like we got that mouse pointer off of our screen as well. Thank you to whoever took care of that for us. Um, anyway, I wanted to, to comment. I think recently there was a hole put in the Canada arm, one of the arms on the space station. It had some debris went right through it. Luckily, it damaged the insulation around it. The arm is still working, but um, that could be a close call. Uh, so stuff is definitely out there. If you haven't seen the movie Gravity, it has some flaws with timings and orbits, right. but it's a heck of a good film and shows how dangerous space debris could be if you were up yeah, there. One but. of the space shuttles actually got a small pit in its window on the flight deck. Uh, from a, It was actually a flake of paint they figured out wow. later. It didn't blow out the window, but that's the kind of thing that makes you think about this. Yeah, and I, I get upset when a truck throws a rock in it and takes a you know, chip yeah. out of my shield on my car. I can't <laughs> imagine being in the shuttle. So of course. Um, I'm gonna go through this story pretty quickly, but it was a neat one um, from Alma, the Atacamba large millimeter, submillimeter array. It measures, um, it's an array, so all these telescopes work together to get very high resolution images. And you can think of it kind of like microwaves. They're millimeter, submillimeter waves, but they're, they're shortish wavelengths, um, not quite as long as radio waves, not quite as short as infrared. So they're in that little gap there. This image was taken. Now you might say, oh, a ring, the eye of Sauron or something. No, um, what you're seeing here is a, indeed a star forming disk. The, the star is in the center of this image. Let me get my pointer out again. Um, the star is down here in the center, which has been mostly masked out. They've, they've removed the starlight so you can see the stuff around it. And this is a planet forming disk. There's probably planets forming within there, the dense material that didn't fall in to form the star fell into a disk and it clumps together and makes planets. Well, right here, that bright spot, that is a giant planet forming. Now, what's super interesting about that, around that giant planet, there is a disk of material. See this fuzzy stuff around the bright spot? Well, that's most likely a moon forming disk around this giant planet that is forming roughly one astronomical unit. That's the distance the Earth is away from our sun, away from its parent star. So there's a giant planet with a moon forming disk around this. So here's a little animation showing what we're talking about and how it works. Big planet, it's hot. The material's flowing, falling in, making it glow. So it's glowing in the infrared. Around that, there's a disk of material falling into the giant planet and outside of that, a clump that is probably forming a moon and other moons will be forming within that disk with the larger star forming or planet forming ring around that star. So folks were asking how stars are formed. Too big of a subject for us to go in tonight. I saw that within the, the chat, but here's your star, little star forming morsel for the evening that you'll get to have. <laughs> um, next story I wanna bring to you is from one of my favorite telescopes. I've always, I always loved going down to Chile to observe. Um, I never got to observe with Gemini down there, but the Blanco, the four meter at uh, Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. Lovely telescope, wonderful staff. I love the, the Chileans down there, just some of the finest uh, folks in observing. Uh, don't expect to get vegetables though when you have dinner. So um, just, you, you gotta eat a lot of uh, empanadas and a lot of meat and you'll get a little bit on the side. So you do what you can do. Um, the foxes are a lot of fun too. There are foxes that live up on the hill and wander around and these cute little, I forget what they're called, the little rabbit, bunny, rodent creature things are, are great fun too. Um, Here's the Blanco, it's a four meter telescope, so a, a pretty darn big telescope. It's up on top of that 
uh, structure in there to get it up out of the winds. You want to be where the wind is very smooth and flows very well. Now that telescope's relatively old. I forget what year it was made, but you know, we have one just like it at Kitt Peak. So there's one in the Northern Hemisphere. There's one in the Southern Hemisphere that you can use to get both sides of the sky. But we update these telescopes with newer and newer instruments. And this is the dark energy camera. It is like a 580 megapixel camera. So CCDs, charge couple devices, very sensitive light. They made an array of these to be able to take big chunks of the sky at once. So you can take an image and see a lot of the sky. Now, indeed, it's doing work to look for dark energy to understand how that works. But that's not what I'm talking about tonight. Tonight, I'm talking about an asteroid that it found. Do you see it? No? Okay, well, here, let's put the discovery together. Here, it was color-coded have been red and blue. In blue, August 13th, 2021, at 2313 minutes, 15 seconds, just three minutes later, it had moved that far. So that sucker's moving really fast, whatever it is. It's moving quickly. Well, you can go and calculate an orbit for that object. It turns out it's an asteroid. It's an asteroid that goes well within the orbit of Mercury, even closer than the one that Patrick was talking about. In fact, this is the fastest asteroid we've ever found. It orbits the most quickly. And of course I said I was gonna go look up how fast it orbits and I forgot to. So you'll have to look that up yourself. It's fast, it goes way faster than Mercury. It's, it's flying a around. asteroid. It's a faster, right? you said you were gonna say that. I thought I you were can't lying. Easy. I'm sorry, it is. Thought you were lying, Chris. I'm, I'm pleased. Who could, I'm not going to lie. So anyway, but this is this is kind of stunning. These asteroids normally are not found this close to the sun. One reason is, well, how did it get there? It had to be thrown down in there somehow. It has to be tweaked to get there. Why didn't it ever emerge and run into one of us? Most of the stuff ran into the little plants. We orbit so quickly. The time scales kind of are sped up for interactions. You get lots and lots of chances to hit things if you're orbiting really quickly. If you're way, way out there and you're only coming into the inner solar system every 10,000 years, the odds of you hitting something are a lot less than when you're flying around that quickly. But the key is that orbit's tilted a little. You can see here, it's not in the plane of the solar system. It does cross it, but that's probably why it's still there and hasn't hit anything because it spends its time above and below most of the planets. So here's that view of this, uh, you know, new asteroid and the very bright sun baking it. Um, I'd be curious to see if there's a, you know, if it has particles coming off of it as well. It would depend on the makeup, what it's like, but getting that close, it's getting baked. Now, you might want to wonder what else is out there. They found this one close to the sun. Are there any that might run into us? We know the dinosaurs got killed by an asteroid um, or at least an object that hit us, probably a large asteroid. Um, luckily, we have data. Uh, the Neowise mission, uh, came from the WISE mission to start with, but NASA's asteroid hunting mission, it uses infrared detectors, like you see here. Um, it's still working now. This is a video from 2018. They haven't updated it recently, but like they say here, more than 29,000 objects. So the blue ones are planets. So we see Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Um, green dots are near Earth object. Those are things that come close to us. The gray ones, by the way, are ones that are not, they're the other asteroids, they don't come close to us, we don't have to worry about them hitting the Earth. So they're mostly, like it says, in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Um, by the way, there's not enough material there to make a planet. You could take all of that, squish it together, you would still have a dwarf planet. It would be a big one, but it would be a dwarf planet. Um, the yellow things are comets. So Neowise is also pretty good at finding comets. Now you might start to worry here just a little bit and say, well, that was a lot of stuff. And that was only between 2013 and 2017. It's been finding more. So should we be worried? There's, you know, I'm in my background here. I've got that thing coming in and hitting Earth. So what are we going to do if one of these is coming at us? Is there, do we have a plan, Chris? Well, actually, yeah, we have a lot of plans. And uh, this is interesting. It's something I've heard about for many, many years. But it turns out there's been some recent progress on this, something I'll show you in just a second. Um, I want to make the point, just so everyone understands, uh, scientists do not at this time know of any asteroid that for sure is definitely going to hit us at all. It's just the possibility of it. There's some that come pretty close, and we keep an eye on them very carefully. We're always calculating the odds that one of them will actually get close enough to be a problem, and more on that a little later from another correspondent here. Uh, but the idea of an asteroid coming in that would be big enough to cause real trouble, uh, this is something Hollywood has dealt with for years. We all know the answer. The answer is, of course, 
they send up a rocket ship with a gigantic nuclear bomb and a bunch of very handsome uh, astronauts blow the thing to smithereens. They vaporize, they powder that thing. Um, it's understandable because an asteroid is a big risk if one is coming towards us, sure. And nuclear weapons are about the most powerful tool most of us can think about. Of course, you'd think to use it. It turns out that's not the best answer for these kinds of things. Uh, one of the things in all of our discoveries of comets uh, and asteroids, both, especially asteroids, flying missions to them, like this picture here of the asteroid Ryugu, uh, this is by the Japanese uh, space program that sent the probe here, um, they are piles of rubble. They are not a giant stone, a solid piece of rock, not by any means. The thing to think about, they're, they're really more like gravel and gravel being held together, sure some boulder size, but smaller stuff too, even dust, held together by weak gravity. These objects don't have strong gravity so that it'd be easy for them to fall apart. Well, if you used, you know, a giant explosive to try to, to pulverize the thing, you might succeed and that would be the worst thing you could possibly do because now instead of one object coming your way, you might have 10, you might have 100, you might have a 1,000 of these headed your way. This is not the strategy you want. Think of it this way. If the Earth is the target, the name of this game, your aim is to miss. You just need it to miss. That's all you need to have happen as it's doing this delicate ballet of going around the sun, which means you, you just need to move it off the target. And the target is small. In some of the diagrams you just saw, it was like the swarms of asteroids around the Earth. It may have seemed like the Earth, it, it couldn't escape, but you got to remember the asteroids and comets and the Earth are very small compared to the vast expanse of space. The Earth's a small target. And consequently, it's easy to move something off that target. Um, you can think of it a little bit more like this. This is more like a game of cosmic billiards. Um, a ball is headed toward the corner pocket. You don't want it to go in. All you have to do is produce some small change in its path. You don't need to pulverize it. That's the worst thing you could do. So maybe the answer is just to give it a tap, a little tiny nudge to deflect it. Well, here's where the news comes in. Uh, we've been talking about doing this for a long time. I got to admit, I was a little surprised when I looked into this and I found out we're about to try it um, right away. As a matter of fact, the DART mission, this is a NASA mission, is going to launch uh, in another month or so. Um, and it is going to send a spacecraft out there, the DART spacecraft, to a double asteroid. Uh, Didymos is the name of the asteroid, Didymos A and Didymos B for the moon. And what they're going to try to do is slam the spacecraft into Didymos B. Now, it's not enough to pulverize it, not enough to break it apart. It's a cosmic tap. The spacecraft isn't that big. But impacting at a high speed of 6.6 .6 kilometers per second, I believe, this spacecraft should be able to produce a change, a subtle change in Didymos's B, Didymos B's orbit around Didymos A, a slight change in the orbit. That's the skill we need to get, and they're going to try it. So September 2022 is when the actual slamming of the spacecraft into this is going to occur. They picked a double asteroid, by the way, but there are a number of them. But the reason they picked this one is because the laws of gravity, if you have two asteroids going around each other, it allows you to calculate very precisely their positions for as they go around one another. You can clock it. So it's easier to get a sense of the change in the orbit. By the way, the European Space Agency is going to send their own spacecraft, the Hera spacecraft, uh, over to this system and have a look at Didymos B to study the crater and see how it behaved. So asteroid uh, avoidance, mitigation, planetary defense, call it what you want. We're about to try it. So launch coming up and we'll cover it in that and out to launch when the time comes. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you couldn't try other things, uh, like, for example, nuclear weapons. Uh, you could use a nuclear device uh, and put it not into, 
not inside an asteroid, but right next to it. And the trick here is that you heat the asteroid up tremendously on one side. And when you do that, the surface will, the part of it will turn into gas and blow away into space. Well, that wor works like a rocket motor that will push the asteroid slightly in the other direction. So the, we have no plans to do anything like this. It's a theoretical idea, but you could use a, a, a nuclear device in that way to nudge a, an asteroid or what have you to the side a little bit. And the same trick, by the way, can be done in a much more gentle way using mirrors, spacecraft that have parabolic mirrors to collect the sun's light and just use sunshine and focus it like you would with a magnifying glass, focusing the sun's energy to a small spot that could heat up a part of the, of the asteroid, produce the outgassing and do the same thing. Now, the weirdest and most exotic idea is what I'm calling a tractor beam, but I'm joking a little bit. They call it a gravity tractor. And the, even a spacecraft, small as it is, has its own gravitational field. It's not strong, but any matter has its own gravitational field. For a smaller asteroid, okay, smaller, not one of the really big ones, but with a small one, the gravity of a spacecraft, if parked near it, or you know, maneuvering around the asteroid in particular ways, could actually exert a little gravitational pull on the asteroid and could change its path. They call that approach a gravity tractor against theoretical possibility. Now, no matter what it is that we do, which approach we use, uh, this is something that's going to need to be done carefully, thoughtfully. You're not gonna just go blow some, something up. People are looking into it, they're testing it now, and we're gonna take our first very careful shot with Didymos starting next year. So good news. Glad to see we're thinking about this and getting ready to protect ourselves. It's good stuff. It's it's something we definitely have to do. Um, it's a real danger. And I just noticed the time we've gone way over like we are want to do at All Space Considered, but it's fine. We're, uh, you're all comfortable at home. You're enjoying the show and I hope you all grabbed a beverage, but we are on to our last uh, subject tonight. And it's actually about an asteroid that, well, it, it's a dangerous one. It's, it's, it's one that's been on our list for danger. To give you an idea about how big it is, um, there's the Hollywood sign that I put onto it. This is Bennu, but maybe it ought to be Bennu, Bennu Wood instead of Hollywood <laughs> on there. But Patrick is here to tell us what we've learned about Bennu. Uh, we visited it, obviously. You've got us a spacecraft there outside of it. And uh, we've reported on this before, but what's the latest on this story about Bennu? Okay, well, first of all, uh, the, uh, the spacecraft uh, was a NASA spacecraft that uh, visited uh, the asteroid Bennu. It's called OSIRIS-REx. And uh, it arrived at uh, uh, Bennu in uh, December of uh, 2018 and spent three years in orbit around this uh, asteroid. And just to survey it, uh, do the photographic survey and, uh, and also study uh, the properties of uh, this asteroid. Um, just to give you an idea, and I know David already, already given us an idea of the scale, um, here's the observatory, this, uh, Katie's beautiful picture, and we're going to, uh, just for scale, uh, uh, superimpose the, uh, the size of Bennu. It's uh, roughly about six and a half times the width of the uh, Griffith Observatory, and uh, so that's how big it is. One of the uh, other parts of this uh, particular mission was that um, the, uh, the spacecraft has a sampling arm and uh, was designed to do a touch and go of the surface. In other words, it would just gently glide down to the surface and with its sampling arm, uh, there was a blast of gas, um, nitrogen gas, and it would just uh, vacuum up some uh, pieces of Bennu. It collected roughly about 60 grams of, uh, or about two ounces of, uh, of uh, Bennu uh, off of its surface here. Now, uh, one of the recent things that came out of uh, the uh, data that, uh, that we got from uh, Bennu is, as David was saying, uh, this asteroid is a near-Earth asteroid, meaning that it can at any time, sometime in the future, will, uh, be, will actually get close to Earth. And uh, there is a time frame for that. And in this uh, graphic here, in uh, September, of, September 4th, 2135, uh, uh, this asteroid uh, will be as close as uh, the distance, uh, half the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So it's just going to be in between the Earth and the Moon. 
at this distance, uh, the Earth's gravitational field can affect its orbit and change its uh, trajectory. And uh, th this is uh, one of the uh, things that scientists have been uh, uh, wanted to calculate is uh, what changes will happen uh, when this happens. Well, we, we know from uh, basically uh, the gravitational effects that happen uh, to, to change objects close to the Earth. And so uh, what uh, OSIRIS-REx has done is that uh, it's, it's allowed uh, scientists to uh, refine uh, Bennu's orbit and allow it to uh, better model the potential of impact um, with the Earth. Now, in this uh, case, in uh, 2135, um, there is no impact, so, so that's good news. But then you can see that where that question mark is. Where that question mark is, is a region of space, and it's represented by all these keyholes, uh, which uh, scientists uh, kind of label it as the gravitational keyholes. If the asteroid would pass through any of those keyholes, uh, the potential of impact would be uh, much greater. So the probability goes up. If it's outside, it will be uh, less uh, probable. And one of the things uh, that they, that Osiris Rex uh, provided was uh, data on the, um, uh, from Bennu. And this data uh, refers to the, uh, the basic uh, properties of, uh, of Bennu. Because there is another effect that can uh, alter the, uh, the trajectory of, uh, of Bennu, and it's not just gravitational. It's something called the Yarakowski effect. Yeah. And, and this effect is uh, basically kind of similar to what uh, uh, Chris was talking about. Uh, this is the natural heating of the daylight side of the asteroid. And in the case of Bennu, Bennu does rotate. And so when the asteroid rotates to the night side, the heat is re-emitted from the uh, night side of the asteroid. And uh, this will, as it cools, this will give the asteroid a slight nudge, a gentle push on the asteroid. Now for Bennu, uh, scientists have calculated uh, from the data from OSIRIS-REx that the, this force is equivalent to um, the weight of three grapes. Now you might think, well, just three grapes, that's not much. But over time, and we're talking about tens of years, this effect can be significant and it will build uh, so much so that this Yarakowski effect will alter the or perturb the uh, orbit of, um, of Bennu. And so what kind of data was, uh, was gathered in order for, it, for uh, scientists to be able to actually uh, calculate this effect? Well, they needed to know uh, the size, the mass, the shape, the rotation state, and the surface and thermal properties of this asteroid. And this is something that is very difficult to get from ground-based observations, but, but, uh, but uh, OSIRIS-REx got all of this data as it, um, during its three-year mission. And uh, all of this were put, all of this data was uh, enabled the scientists to uh, actually uh, calculate and, and factor in this Yarakowski effect into the, um, into the trajectory uh, models that they had. Uh, so the original kind of estimate was that there was a potential for impact uh, further down the line in 2182, but with the uh, data that was uh, uh, observed from, um, from OSIRIS-REx, um, they were able to refine the actual um, probability uh, actually by 20, a factor of 20 fold. And they now have an estimate that the impact probability of uh, Bennu crashing into the earth is one in 2700 or about 0.037%, which is minuscule. And, and is, it, it means that it's, uh, it, it offers a uh, very lit, very little risk of impact. Now, one thing is for sure, um, the OSIRIS-REx uh, spacecraft, next slide, is returning to Earth. And in September of 2023, this little capsule, there it goes, containing a little piece of Bennu, it's a sample return capsule, will end up with a thump in the in the deserts of Utah, 
And uh, the probability of impact is close to 100%, but we'll have um, actually Bennu uh, crashing into the earth inside That's a capsule. <laughs> yeah. A tiny, tiny piece of Bennu yeah. is going to come crashing down with 100%, well, nearly as Patrick nearly. said. Yeah. It could go a little wrong. Um, well, folks, with, with that, uh, we can all rest easy with that good news that uh, 161-ish years from now, we have a very small chance of being hit by Bennu. I was being kept up at night by that concern. Um, but in any case, this is it's, it's interesting being able to measure these details and knowing what sort of things you need to worry about. People often think, why can't we just see where it's going, know its orbit? Once you have it calculated, you know it pretty well. Well, the answer is we don't. Things can change. Um, they can get nudged by other objects, and even the very sunlight falling upon the object can cause it to deviate where it's going. Um, objects can spin up too. Uh, sunlight can spin the objects up. It's super cool. Anyway, folks, we have reached the end of our show tonight. I do want to thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to thank once again uh, the City of Los Angeles, the Department of Recreation and Parks that owns and operates Griffith Observatory and makes tonight possible, makes programs like this possible. Um, also our foundation, Griffith Observatory Foundation, our nonprofit partner helps us with so much of what we do at Griffith Observatory. I really do thank all of you that made donations tonight with our fundraising and any of you that decided to become a member tonight. It really does help things like our online school program, get fifth graders to virtually visit the building and even more. We're open right now on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So if you're in town, you can come up and see us. We're free and open to the public and our telescopes operate on all nights that we're open, that it's clear, but you gotta get in line early. We don't promise anybody of you. And once again, I wanna thank our guest, Professor Emily Levest, um, Patrick So, one of our regulars, Chris Butler, um, and thank you to everybody that joined us tonight on YouTube and uh, everywhere else we stream and come see us in person. And we'll see you next month on October 1st. For the next All Space Considered. Thanks, folks. Thank you, everybody. Good night.